Let me say right up front that this is another hard-hitting, heavy-hitting passage as we continue in our sermon series looking at 1 Samuel, this Old Testament um, book of the Bible. You may have um, picked up for yourself from the reading this repeated refrain that keeps coming up throughout the section, the heavy hand of the Lord. Just glance down, let me show you some of the verses on this. Verse 6 of chapter 5, or on page 275. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod. In its vicinity, he brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. Again in verse 7, when the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon, our God. Verse 9, but after they had moved the ark, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old. Over the page, end of verse 11, for death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. You see this repeated refrain, the heavy hand of the Lord. And in this section, it falls not just on the Philistines. Did you notice by the end, it falls on God's own people as well. Verse 19. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemeth, Israelites, God's own, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. This heavy hand of the Lord. It falls on the Philistines. It falls on the Israelites. It pretty much falls on everyone in the chapter. And is it no wonder then that we get this my terrible cry at the end of the passage, verse 20, who can stand in the presence of this holy God? And I wonder if that's a question you've ever asked yourself. Who can stand in the presence of a holy God? Can I stand before the Lord? Can I stand before his holiness? I wouldn't be surprised if it's not a question that you've thought of. Because it's not a question much in people's minds today. Most people, when it comes to God, if they think he's there, if they think he's real, they think me and God, we're okay. I mean, he made me, didn't he? He loves me, doesn't he? That's what Christians keep telling me. What do you mean who can stand before a holy God? Anyone can, can't they? Not according to this passage. Not once you reckon with the heavy hand of the Lord and God's holiness. That is his moral majesty, his moral beauty, perfection, purity that burns against all the sin and evil and injustice of this world. And so that people, sinful people, fall down dead before him. Who can stand in the presence of a holy God? And so this passage is a wake-up call for us this afternoon. In particular, it is a wake-up call for any of us here, whether you call yourself Christian or not, who plays fast and loose with God's word, who does not take God's holiness seriously in their lives. But everyone's playing fast and loose with the truth at the moment, particularly at my work. And if I want to succeed and progress, that is what I have to do. And surely God doesn't really mind with one or two white lies here and there. But we love each other. And we're not doing anyone else any harm. What could possibly be wrong with that? Look, I know God's word tells me to be generous with my money that I should give regularly to my local church, but you know, things are tight right now. London's expensive. I'm still paying off some of my student debt. I think I'll just hang back, give it a little while, wait until I've saved up a little bit more. We think that these things don't matter. 
But we're going to see they matter hugely to God. And we ignore his word, we play fast and loose with his holiness to our peril. Well, let's see that now from the verses. First, the Lord's heavy hand on idolatry. It falls on Dagon in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 5. The so-called God, who's no God at all. And then it falls on the Philistines, worshippers of Dagon, in verses 6 to 12. And the point could not be clearer. I mean, the Lord hates idolatry. The Lord hates any form of false worship. Seeking our ultimate happiness, meaning, satisfaction to life in anyone or anything apart from him. Have a look at verse 1. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. Now, for any Israelite reading these verses, alarm bells are going to be ringing in their ears. You shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment, the most important of all, of all the Ten Commandments. And what have the Philistines done? They've taken the Ark of God, which represents God's presence with his people, and they've laid it before Dagon, this other god. This is showdown time. This is the Lord versus Dagon. And who is going to come out on top? Verse 3. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. It is a humiliation for Dagon. It is like the knockout punch in the first round. He is left prostrate, flat on his face, before the ark of the Lord. Now, the Philistines might think that's just a coincidence that he fell in that way. Maybe he just got knocked over. Maybe there's a huge gust of wind like the storms are experiencing today. Perhaps a bolt got loose. So they picked Dagon up, picked him back up again. Verse 4. But the following morning, when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord again. This time, his head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold floor, only his body remained. And the original Hebrew is more subtle. It says, only Dagon remained. I.e., cut off his head, so he can't think or can't speak, cut off his arms, so he can't actually do anything, and that's the real Dagon. This so-called God, who is no God at all. Can't think, can't speak, can't act. And to this day, verse 5, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who entered Dagon's temple at Ash had stepped on the threshold because this really happened. And Dagon fell over twice, prostrate, before the ark of the Lord. There is only one true God, the Lord God. And all other so-called gods are no gods at all. And to show just how seriously the Lord takes this, takes him being the one true God, how seriously he takes idolatry, any form of false worship, well, his heavy hand falls on the Philistines too. Tumors, verse 6. Affliction, verse 9. Death, verse 11. Death in Ashdod. Death in Gath. Death in Ekron. Wherever the ark of the Lord goes, whichever city in Philistia, death, death, death. Do you see how seriously the Lord takes this? Do you see how seriously he takes his holiness? We think these things don't matter, they do. breaking the first commandment, having any other gods before him. It is this serious. Death, death, death. Now look, this could not be more relevant for us given the globalized world we live in today with multiple religions, multiple worldviews, multiple belief systems. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. 
And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. You shall love him alone. Jesus Christ, the person who sits right at the heart of the Christian faith. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now look, I know how controversial these words of Jesus Christ are. I know how unpolitically correct these words of Jesus and these words of the Bible are. It could be right now, as you hear it, you're bristling a little bit inside. But if we are to truly grasp the message of Christianity, we need to grapple with what is being said from this passage. We need to reckon with the seriousness of idolatry before a holy God, religious idols like Allah, like Buddha, like Krishna. Ultimately, are no gods at all. They cannot act on your behalf. They say to you, you need to save yourself. You need to be good enough for me. Not one of them will ever lay down his life for you. But that is exactly what the God of the Bible has done for you in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. He will do anything in his power and love to save you, the one true God of the Bible. Worldview idols, atheism, secular humanism, cultural Marxism. These idols cannot bear the weight of the big existential questions of life. They are gods made in our own image. They are products of our own fallen reason and imagination. They can't think for themselves. They can't speak for themselves. Only our creator can tell us the very mysteries of the universe. Only the one who made the universe made us, gave us life. Only he can give us the meaning of life, and he's done that. He's spoken fully and finally through his son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. Secular idols... Money, sex, power, control, approval. These things will crush you if you idolize them. If you make them the source of your ultimate meaning, your ultimate satisfaction, if it is beauty, looks, what about when you age and it fades? If it's approval, what about when you fail? If it's your career success, what about if you make it and you realize you've not got a family to share it with? There's no marriage left. Don't get me wrong, these things are good things, good gifts from the Lord. But if we forget the Lord, look to the gifts and not the giver. For the ultimate satisfaction, we will die a thousand deaths every day. Death, death, death. And even if you are one of the very few lucky ones to have it all, money, success, spouse, family, looks, beauty, a retirement to a joy, and there you are in the Algarve, teeing up on the first green, or the first fairway, sun on your back, the sea glistening behind you, just about to take your first swing and suddenly there's some tension in your heart and it gets tighter and tighter and you can no longer breathe and you collapse to the ground. Death comes to us all. And who is going to help you then? There is only one person in the history of humanity who has conquered death, who has risen from the grave. There is only one true God of this universe. And he has revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And all other gods, so-called gods, are no gods at all. They will all fail you. There's only one person who will never fail you. Which idols do you and I need to turn from right now and say sorry to the Lord and confess it to him and come back to Jesus Christ? 
Well, if that's the first thing to see from this passage, the Lord's heavy hand on idolatry, the second thing to see is the Lord's heavy hand on complacency. Because, as we said at the start, it falls on the Israelites too. It falls on God's people too, who don't take God's word seriously enough. This is a wake-up call for Christians, for us. So verse 13, flick over the page, 276. We'll come back to this middle section in the next point. Verse 13, the ark of the Lord makes makes its way back to Israelite territory. And we're told in verse 13, the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley, and when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. Yes, the ark is back. The Lord is with us again. Joy in their hearts. It's a great start. But things soon take a turn for the worst because they end up, in verse 14, sacrificing the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord, something they shouldn't have done. These are female cows. They've left their calves behind. Should be a male bull. But perhaps the, you know, Phyllis, uh, the Israelites think it doesn't really matter. It's a cow anyway. But then look at verse 19. 70 of them put to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. And we may think to ourselves, my goodness, that's a bit harsh. What's the big deal with looking into the ark of the Lord? It was a very big deal. The ark of the Lord was like an embodiment of the Lord's presence with his people. So as you approach the ark, it's like you are approaching the holy God. And that is why the ark of God was put in the most holy place behind a curtain because you couldn't come close to a holy God without dying. And when they were on the move and taking the ark with them, they used to wrap the ark up in a curtain. There were specific people, the Kothahites from the Levite clan, alone who were meant to deal with these things. And in Numbers 4.20, if you want the reference, there is a clear warning to the Kothahites not to look into the ark lest you die. The Israelites knew this. The Lord had warned them about it. These these people from Beth Shemeth, they knew they weren't Kothahites. They knew they couldn't go near the ark, let alone look into the ark. And yet, for whatever reason, they did. They were complacent with God's word. They didn't take his holiness seriously. Who knows why they did it? Perhaps they thought they knew better than God. Perhaps they thought, maybe this part of God's word doesn't apply to me anymore. Perhaps they thought, you know what? I just really want to take a look and forgot about the consequences. Who knows? But we know the outcome. The Lord's word never lies. You look into the ark, you will die. They looked into the ark. What happened? They died. The Lord's heavy hand on complacency. Did you see this week that Li Wenleng and the Chinese whistleblower who discovered the coronavirus died from exposure to it? I didn't know this. He first raised the alarm about it, warned fellow medics in an online chat group in December about it. His comments were shared on Weibo with the hashtag Wuhan SARS, but the posts were scrubbed by censors, and he ended up being accused of rumor-mongering by Chinese authorities who did not take his warning seriously enough, were too complacent about it, and as we all know, we're all facing this global health emergency. And that is nothing compared to the complacency when it comes to God's perfect word. Where are you playing fast and loose with God's word at the moment? Where you are thinking to yourself, oh God, wait, that's not really mind. That this aspect of God's word doesn't apply to me or us today that I just really want to take a look and think that, feel that, say that, do that and you have lost sight of the consequences. Do you see the report this week from the Terence Higgins Trust about the soaring numbers of sexually transmitted infections in this country? Over the last decade alone, cases of gonorrhea have risen by 249%, Rates of syphilis by 165% as more and more young people are having more and more sex with more and more partners before marriage. The report says this should be a wake-up call for the government. But I hope you can see we've had the wake-up call for the past 2,500 years since this passage was written and given to us. 
and the terrible consequences of playing fast and loose with God's word. Sex, a wonderful gift from God to be enjoyed within and only within the bond of marriage. Here is a warning then, specifically to Christians, those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, not to be complacent with God's word, whether it's in your relationships, your finances, your commitment to church, or your own personal walk with the Lord. We play fast and loose to our peril. doesn't mean you're going to get struck down dead, but a slow drifting from the Lord And one day all of us will see him face to face and have to give account of our whole lives. So the Lord's heavy hand on idolatry, the Lord's heavy hand on complacency. Let's finish now with this question. Who then can stand in the presence of a holy God? Because look, we've all mucked up with this. I've mucked up with this. This week, you have. We all play fast and loose with God's word. None of us love God perfectly. At times, we all struggle to take his holiness seriously. You'll have come to church today, you know full well that in certain ways this week, you've acted like the Philistines. You've acted a bit like the Israelites. You could be thinking to yourself, well, is the heavy hand of the Lord going to fall on me? Or is there any hope? Well, the good news is, there is hope. The message of the Bible, the gospel, is good news, and we see some of that good news in verse 4. With the Philistines' question, what guilt offering should we send to him? It is ironic that in a passage of Scripture, a section of the Bible, all about the heavy hand of the Lord, it is the Philistines, God's enemies, not the Israelites, God's own people, who seem to have a better idea of what they need to do. We are sinful, we are guilty before a holy God. There needs to be some guilt offering. Verse 5. Perhaps he will lift his hand from us and our gods and our land. Now look, what we need to know about pagan idolatry is that these other so-called gods demanded a sacrifice from their worshippers in order to turn away their anger. And the more precious the sacrifice you brought to this so-called god, the more likely they would do what you wanted. So you bring your crops and you'd give us a lot more crops back or bring the rains for us or bring money so we could be rich. Or in some extreme cases, people would sacrifice their own children to the God of Molech. We'll do this for you. We'll make this precious sacrifice for you and then you do this for me. That is why, by the way, it's gold rats, gold tumors. Gold, it's precious, it's metal. Look what we're making for you. We'll do this for you. You get rid of these rats and tumors from us. If only the Philistines knew what the Lord God is really like and that he is completely different from all these all so-called gods because the Lord God of the Bible never demands that we make a sacrifice for him to turn away his anger. But the Lord God always provides the sacrifice himself. And ultimately, what is that sacrifice? It is him. Back here, it was the Passover lamb. It was a substitute. It was someone else to pay for your sin, to die in your place. But the lamb was only ever a picture of the ultimate lamb, Jesus Christ, who was born to die and to bear our sin and bear our guilt and have the heavy hand of his father fall on him so it would never fall on us. I will provide the sacrifice. I will be the sacrifice. Not so that perhaps I'm gonna, you're going to be all right. No, so you can know for sure that you are forgiven, that you are loved, that you are precious to him. I will give up what is most precious to me, my son, for you. It is completely different. He loves you that much willing to die for you so you could be absolutely sure of his forgiveness and your right standing with him, not just now, but for eternity. In his book, Cross-Examined, Mark Mennell tells the story of a girl called Mary and her brother Johnny. Mary desperately needs a blood transfusion in order to survive a rare disease. 
And the doctor explains to Johnny that since he had recovered from the same disease, he has the same blood type, and that Mary's only chance for survival is a transfusion of Johnny's blood. And so the doctor asks the boy, will you give your blood to Mary? Now, at this point, the boy hesitates. He's unsure. And the doctor can see that the boy's lower lip is quivering a little bit at the thought of what he has to go through. And after a bit of time, the boy, sort of with a settled disposition, smiles to the doctor and says, yes, of course, I'll give my blood for my sister. And so they wheel the two of them in on their trolleys, and Mary's pale and thin, and Johnny's strong and healthy. They don't really look at each other, catch a glance, you know, he smiles. And the nurses start to take some of the blood. After a while, Johnny turns to the doctor. He says, when do I die? And at this point, the doctor realized why he was so hesitant, why there's this long pause, why this was the quivering of his lip, because he thought to give your blood ultimately meant that he had to pay the ultimate price to save his sister and to sacrifice himself, and yet he still went through with it. Now, of course, in this example, Johnny didn't have to die to save his sister, but I hope you see Jesus Christ had to die to save you and me, had to pay the ultimate price, had to sacrifice himself. That is what it takes to deal with God's holiness, this heavy hand of the Lord. And you know what? Even though he knew that, he went through it for you. He was that willing. Do you see how much he loves you? Do you see the lengths he will go to for you? And so please turn to him, turn back to him. Why are we going after all these other things in the world? Most of them just gifts from God anyway when we've got a savior who loves us like this. And will do this for us. Why do we play fast and loose with his word when we know he has our best interests at heart? It's a good word. It is right, it is true. He's trying to protect us from the mess we get ourselves into. Would you turn back to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one true God, the one who has paid the ultimate price, laid down his life for you? Will you be holy as he is holy? Confess your sin, receive forgiveness, be assured, seek his strength, live for him in the week ahead. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much indeed for these two chapters of 1 Samuel. They are hard hitting. They are hard to hear as we see your heavy hand come upon the Philistines, your own people. But as you take us deep down into the nature of idolatry complacently, so ultimately through Jesus Christ, you bring us up. And even though we don't deserve it, you forgive us. Even though we don't deserve it, you love us. You pay the ultimate sacrifice for us, would we see how wonderful and glorious you are? No one else like you, the one true God of this universe, the very meaning of our lives. And please, would you move our hearts to come back to you, to turn from all of these other things that just pale into insignificance to who you are and receive afresh your forgiveness and seek your strength to change and live lives of holiness after you, the holy God, And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.